Hello and welcome to our UKLA conversation series. Uh, my name is Naveen Govinder. I'm from the University of Strathclyde in Glasgow. Um, and today I'm talking to Sabine Little um, about how as higher education tutors and lecturers we're making the move to online teaching and learning. Um, so hello Sabine, uh, do you want to maybe just introduce yourself a little? Yeah, sure. So my name is Sabina Little. I'm a lecturer in languages education at the University of Sheffield and there I also direct the International Postgraduate Certificate in Education. So we've got about 70 students who are all learning how to be teachers online. So the program has always been online. And the reason we're chatting today really is because we got talking couple of weeks ago or so um, and I actually for the UKLA convened the literacy and multilingualism special interest group but we were starting to talk about teaching online and I've been working online since the early 2000s really um, so I've been directing online distance programs for a long time and at some point I was working for one of the centers for excellence in teaching and learning enhancing technology enhanced learning um, across the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences. So I've done a fair bit of online distance learning and while there's always more to learn, we thought that maybe getting together today might be a good idea to, to explore some of our different contexts and some ideas. Yeah, and I think that's, that's exactly right. It's, um, I think there's such a broad range of expertise and, and experience out there, you know, so some of, uh, some of us are engaging with this or making this move for the first time um, or the move is more extensive, you know, um, and so the varying range of skills available and experiences is probably what we uh, what we want to talk about, um, which is why I think it's brilliant that, um, that that you'll get to speak because I think there's a lot of a lot of what you do that will now start becoming perhaps a little more mainstream, mm. um, and so your expertise would be brilliant. So what we've done is we've collated some of the questions that we received from other UKLA members. Um, and the first kind of question that, that we got, or set of questions, revolved around interaction. And you know, so how do you use these online platforms, whether it's Teams or Zoom or whatever it is, to, to get some kind of interaction and conversation going, especially with large groups, um, that you, that you might have only been able to get in a face-to-face -face setting. Yeah, I think that can be really tricky because when you think about it, we all know that life of university isn't just sitting in a classroom and, and being taught. There is the social aspect of, of being able to, to grab a peer and going off for a cup of coffee or something. Um, and, and yeah, there is a lot of peer-to-peer, peer-to-tutor interaction. And then there's kind of the whole cohort all together that has this, this community feel, this sense of identity. And it can be quite tricky, but not impossible to try and replicate that in an online context. So I do try to think of it literally as trying to facilitate that tutor to student communication. That's, that's fairly straightforward. Um, and then the cohort as a whole where you, you create the sense of identity and where you create opportunities for everybody to contribute to ideas, take things forward, maybe have discussions, for example, but also opportunities for the students to, to hang out unobserved, for want of a better word, to try and grab that virtual coffee, to create spaces where it is possible to just pose a question like, what did you have for tea? Or, you know, just, just things that you would have in a face-to-face -face context or in a, in a, in a campus-based context. And I think not overlooking those in a virtual platform is really important. Okay, nice. Yeah, I think, that, I think you're exactly right. It's, um, you know, so some of these concerns are about um, whether or not these online platforms only allow one person to speak at a time, mm -hmm. and especially in large groups, um, how do you manage giving students the space to, to speak to each other and then to speak back to whole class uh, scenarios. Um, so do you have any ideas about, about, about managing that and what that might look like? Yeah, I think it very much depends on, on what you're trying to do at any one time. So for example, are you, are you trying to set up a space that um, 
is is very fleeting you know you're trying to set up a space for a seminar where everybody chats to each other and then then afterwards it, it's gone or you're trying to create an actual environment um that is maintained and that has opportunities for synchronous and asynchronous communication for an extended period of time and allowing students even two months later to come back and go oh that's what i contributed to that and actually now i want to draw on that for my assignment or you know those so, so i think those are two different ways of looking at what technology has to offer us um and similarly synchronous and asynchronous offers some opportunities for for managing numbers so asynchronous communication is much more manageable with a larger cohort because you know the the, the conversation sort of drips forward whereas if you've got 80 people um, in an online seminar and they're all trying to say something at the same time then you would probably end up breaking people into smaller subgroups um, to, to try and keep that manageable and we have about 70 plus students in maybe 36 37 countries they're all in different time zones for that reason all my teaching is almost all is asynchronous because every time i try it doesn't matter whether i pick 4 a.m uk time or, or 2 p.m uk i'm always disadvantaging somebody so maybe the idea is to, to ask a question and give students 36 hours however long you want to respond on an online discussion board and discuss with them share with them what you think is a valuable discussion post this is something that i deal a lot with um you know in in, in a discussion that actually moves forward you don't go agreed you know, it's, it's not quite the same as you what might you might post on you know on a, on a mate's facebook page for example yeah. so some of the things that we've talked about is that you know in 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 a valuable discussion point you know you would try to bring the discussion forward would try to respond to what somebody else said in front of you rather than just adding your two pennies worth without acknowledging any work that anybody else has done um, you might draw on your your personal or professional experience you might bring in something that you've read so by the time you think about all of that it'll be highly unlikely that it'll be you know a, a 20 word response and and on the program that i direct people really that's that's where the teaching takes place so they take the time to really engage with those posts and some of them we're about to start a blog because some of them are like 500 words long um and the reason we're starting a blog to get that, to capture that kind of learning is because every summer i go in and i scrub all the discussion boards and i felt really guilty because i felt like i was destroying a lot of labor that the students had put in so we were looking for an alternative output so moving st shifting stuff around from the synchronous to the asynchronous from real-time input to something that might be more film focused and then thinking about where to create these spaces for for peer interaction so that the seminars are not even though you might have 20 students in the room ultimately they are turning up thinking that they are there to engage with you no yeah. so but in 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 a more workshop kind of scenario if you create opportunities for them to talk to each other so you might set a reflective task and you're there but ultimately you're, you're stepping back and you're seeing you know them with their ideas or even hand over leadership and say okay you know on a on a friday afternoon or whenever um you're going to take it in turns and each one of you is going to reflect on you know something that you've read or you know just just creating more opportunities for that peer-to-peer -peer interaction and expertise development i guess yeah yeah so and because uh, i think that that opens up it sounds like it's it's really opening up um a range of different spaces and possibilities um like i like i said you know um often maybe when we're if we're not comfortable not familiar with the some of the software that we're we're using we're, we're limited by what we think uh, the software itself does and allows us to do um so you know um if if we're moving and if we're planning for for interactions across you know, uh, students maybe working on their own in their homes, uh, in small groups, um, in seminars, in lecture kind of 
Zoom uh, meetings, um, I think like the, the combination, the various combinations of those is probably what may enable or disenable certain kinds of community building and interactions. Right? Yeah, hopefully. And I think the thing to remember is that the students that we are teaching on teacher training, of course, they will have a very different placement experience as well, you know, going into school. So for some of them, they will find themselves in a position of actually having to teach online or to first shadow a class online or whatever. So I think that is potentially a very real possibility for next year. So thinking about that and building that into, into their learning experience, that they have a chance to, to, to manage those interactions rather than just participating in them, but actually actively being responsible for making them work, I think will then ultimately also help with, with any PGCE or PGDE learning outcomes as well. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think you're absolutely right. I think, you know, the, what, what schooling will look like from now on is also about, uh, is, is also changing. Um, and so thinking about how, how different technologies and our abilities to use them um, help us think about teaching and learning, not only in higher education, but help us to think about it at school level um, is also really useful. So, you know, one of the things that I know came up um, in relation to that is around, you know, providing learners or even students with access to resources, so access to webinars and, you know, uh, a lot of us maybe generating content um, and just putting it out there and not necessarily scaffolding how students are meant to interact with it and where they're meant to start, uh, what they're supposed to do before, during and after engaging with, say, a webinar, for example. Um, do, you think, do you think that there's any advice that you could give for, for us to, that would help us think about what, what do those instructions look like and what are the various forms that we can provide input so that we can work across these asynchronous and synchronous um, platforms? Yeah, I think that's, that's really important and a really important question because you're absolutely right. I think now there are more resources available or have been made available in the last three months than, than there have ever been. And you can, you know, you can take your pick from the number of celebrities you want to do story night. And, you know, so, so the, the sheer and the number of authors who have come together and created resources, for example, to be used in, in teaching is absolutely phenomenal. So in, in engaging, I guess there's, again, we've talked about this in, in preparing for this today, that it's a bit meta when we're thinking about how do we teach the teacher trainees, but at the same time, through that, we are looking at resources aimed at the children, ultimately, um, the end learner. So how do we facilitate, A, um, teacher trainees to, to engage with pedagogical resources, but also how do we enable them to make the best out of the resources available for children, um, either still during the COVID crisis or going forward, because those resources hopefully won't go away and will still be available. So I think those are two slightly different um, points. I think with most pedagogical resources, um, they come with, with some sort of learning outcomes or you know at least a sort of mission statement of like us two we're talking together you know for, for specific purposes so hopefully that is slightly slightly more covered shall I say um, and I've certainly found that my students have have been quite capable of of watching different resources and taking away what they felt was useful to them. Although bearing in mind, we are now at the end of the academic year rather than at the beginning of the academic year. So that might need some additional scaffolding. So, but that might just need a, a tutor saying, you know, here's a resource I thought you might find useful. I particularly enjoyed finding out about this and here is how it ties to the programme. That kind of thing is, I think, fairly easily done. Um, in terms of creativity of, of actually using the various resources that are around, um, that obviously depends on, on what kind of teacher training program is, so, so for what sector, for example. Um, and I think that would potentially need 
either um, tutor input in terms of here's an idea of what you might do with this or a specific task. Here is a resource as a group or individual. Go away for two hours. Think about what you might do with a class of six-year-olds, three-year-olds, seven-year-olds, 14-year-olds, whatever the resource is, and then come back and share it. And then through that sharing, build up the expertise and the flexibility of working with these kinds of resources. Yeah. How, how easily manage, manageable do you think it is to, to do something like that with, say, larger groups? Um, so I know like for, for myself with the PGDE English, we, we can get anywhere between um, 65 and 90 students in a single cohort. Um, and although there are two of us working on the, uh, on the program, um, you're so, you know, we're still quite used to working with those large groups um, in, in the kind of large workshop and, and seminar type settings. Um, yeah, do you have any ideas of how we might be able to manage something like that? I think something as interactive as that will be difficult. I'm plucking a number out of thin air, but I would say with anything bigger than 15, you're going to start struggling because even, you know, if, if but having said that, as a tutor, you don't have to be everywhere at once. So if you set up breakout rooms, that doesn't mean that you have to stick with one particular group. You know, imagine in any classroom, you've got your, your larger number of kids, but you would walk around if they're doing any work to check on them individually. In the same way, you can pop in and out of, um, you know, subgroups that you're setting up on Zoom, for example, just check, you know, hang in there for 10 minutes, maybe give a bit of input and then drop over to the next one. And you could still, you could, for example, then ask each group um, if you're using you know, any of the, the many whiteboard programs, for example, um, you could ask them to, to summarize key ideas to share with the wider group at large and make those available. Just even, you know, even if somebody's taking notes and they take a screenshot of, you know, there's, there's so many different opportunities. Um, or they can, they can record part of their conversation and as, as part of the task, prepare a short presentation on ideas that they have and then you can edit them all together you know, into a short video just by, not, not by creating an Oscar worthy masterpiece, but literally just shoving them together into a single unit. You know, if every group comes up with a five minute presentation um, and you've got four groups of, of 15, um, then that, that gives 20 minutes worth of resource to share with the entire group afterwards. And hopefully the students will then see that their thinking and their, their efforts are being fed back to the group at large. So it's not as though it's a task that they engage with um, and then they, they go off and do their own thing, but actually it's valued in such a way that something is coming out of it and it can be shared with the group. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's really interesting. Uh, I, I think um, just as you're speaking, I'm imagining how our students could break out into their rooms, almost do um, like little micro teaching sessions, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and kind of teach each other a topic, you know, whether it's pitched at um, high school level or if it's pitched at a kind of a teacher education level. Um, and then if they, if they recorded that or created, it resulted in some kind of text being produced that could be uploaded to like our internal online learning system um, and there could be a process where all students all the groups can then go and watch or access two or three other groups work mm -hmm. um, and provide comments and, and kind of engage in that way um, yeah I, I mean some of this also opens up I think the possibilities for rethinking the kinds of texts that students produce, you know, so we're, we're very, I think we're very used to students maybe producing on one side, you know, assessment kind of tasks where it's essays and presentations and things that they submit for, for their own education. But if they're also submitting drafts of the kinds of activities and texts that they want to use in their own classrooms, mm -hmm. um, should some of those texts include, you know, audio texts, videos, um, um, other kinds of PowerPoints or different kinds of 
presentation styles uh, or formats uh, uh, and things like that. Um, yeah, I think I think that starts to really open up what's what's possible, and again, the kinds of texts that make it into a classroom, um, because mm -hmm. more and more we're hopefully being we're, we're hopefully starting to see that this broad range of texts and ways of communicating are becoming more and more relevant and then pertinent um, for survival. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think you're absolutely right. I think the you know the the way in which teaching and well maybe the way in which learning works is is changing uh my son is downstairs right now well no right now he's doing history or something but earlier over lunchtime he ended up watching old rough science videos which those of a certain age will remember was an open university program where they dumped scientists in a remote location and through their scientific wit um they, they had to survive and find scientific solutions to random things and he does that in his spare time so so you know the way children learn is becoming much more media linked in a certain way and i think schools do that as well there is an awful lot of of media linked and related education i'm not advocating that everything has to happen in front of a screen but i think um overarchingly we can as, as a as a profession get more creative with the way we think about learning and teaching and again there's there's nothing wrong with you know then then taking it one step further and taking it into the school classroom and, and students doing a, a narrated powerpoint or whatever it is and you know if every student does one slide with a book on it and here are the book recommendations of class 4c or whatever and you edit them all together and you've got a, something that you can share with a head of school or with parents all of these kinds of things make make the the link between everybody you now if you've got something you can email to parents and say just just watch what your kids did um just much more connected overall yeah no, that's brilliant. I mean, um, hopefully in the future we'll pick up on that, the other side of that conversation, you know, uh, you raised that this is, you know, is this a question of how we engage with students and then how do we engage with students as teachers moving into classrooms. Um, so hopefully we'll, at some point we'll be able to tackle that kind of second question of stepping closer and closer uh, into classroom practice. Um, but I think this has been like really interesting and really revealing about the possibilities of what teacher education could look like and how we navigate all of these kind of online and real spaces. Um, I was wondering, I know you showed it to me the last time and um, kind of going back to that question of space, um, that you, if you could talk through that resource um, for, um, uh, on, on classroom spaces um, and this just kind of picks up on that question that we received about uh, virtual reality and whether or not that technology is relevant for our discussion and for higher ITE providers. Yeah definitely so in, in preparing and in reading the questions there, there was the question about virtual reality now I mean, virtual reality would, would argue that the person is in the space and is moving through the space. Um, that is slightly different and requires slightly different technology, you know, in terms of goggles, etc. But what I think is really useful is virtual tours. And I've actually done a bit more prep since we, <laughs> since we chatted about this yesterday. So if it's all right for me to share my screen and just do a bit of walking through, shall we give that a go? Sure. Um, Right, fingers crossed. So, and um, I want to share a resource that colleagues did, first of all, uh, in the School of Education of Broomhall Nursery School in Sheffield. And they went in with 360 degree cameras to put together this space analysis. So just like a Google map, essentially, you can, you can click on different spaces and then do this 360 degree overview of where you are and I've just snook at myself because I wanted to get to the library at the far end but I've got something I've got something else to show you but yeah so this is this is one example where students 
without having to necessarily visit a space because I think that will potentially be difficult um, or certainly reduced um, you know, in terms of how many different spaces a student might be able to access. But there are a number of these resources available. I'm just going to share another one. No. So this is what I was quite surprised actually. All I did was I ran a search on 360, no, virtual school, virtual tours, primary school. And these are just some of the results that came up. Now this one I found interesting because it's got children in it. Um, I'm assuming this is an official <laughs> primary school's website. So I'm assuming they've got the appropriate um, permissions for this. But this, for example, would be great to do an analysis of you know, how is this classroom set up, who is doing what, at what tables, what kind of learning stations are set up, you know, what can you see on the walls. Um, so this is just one of the many ways in which you know, there's, there's a reading corner and I'm going to see if I can get this last one to work. There, this is the library of another primary school. So again you can, you can have a more detailed look around and see how it's set up in terms of you know in terms of technology in terms of shelving um it takes a bit of navigating this one in particular um but just working out how you can then compare different learning spaces for example and if you start searching um once you start for for my program for the ipgce i'm quite keen that my students get a chance to compare international um, educational contexts. So I found a school in Taiwan, for example, that the students can look at. And for me, that is really, really important. And either way, my students, COVID or no COVID, won't be able to travel around the world and look at varying um, educational contexts. So hopefully, again, this is something many, many schools themselves have got this on their sites. Many schools have put it together due to COVID instead of being able to, to run um, open days for incoming pupils. So actually, again, this is something where over the last few months, um, a lot has been done and a lot of additional resources have been created. So using that creatively, hopefully, will be, will be one way of, of using technology to make it a bit easier for students to compare different learning spaces and learn from that kind of setup. Hmm. Well, that's, uh, I think that's brilliant. The, the idea of one gaining access to these spaces so that um, like student teachers um, can, can analyze them and think seriously about how these learning spaces are constructed. Um, and especially across different contexts, uh, you know, so how, how different classrooms represent different subject areas or disciplines, how they represent different teachers and teaching styles, how they represent different um, countries and contexts and, um, and stuff like that. I think that's, that sounds fantastic. It also kind of raises um, the possibility of student teachers perhaps redesigning mm -hmm. those classroom spaces in the face of their own contexts and concerns and, um, and in terms of COVID, you know, how rethinking what those spaces might look like. I know already on Twitter, uh, you know, uh, in-service teachers have been, you know, going, returning back to schools and, um, you know, arranging their classrooms and using kind of national and um, other guidance to, to rethink their classrooms already. And so they've been posting pictures um, about what they're showing, what their classrooms look like now. Um, and so this is, you know, again, just another way of accessing some of those ideas and, and really interrogating what, what classroom environments can and should or might look like. Um, yeah, definitely. And I think especially what becomes very obvious in, in that, that first resource that I shared that colleagues from the School of Education did, I mean, that's an early years context and that's set up for continuous provision where, where teachers plan for Know, possible lines of learning, child initiated play, etc. When you take COVID into account and the removal of anything that might potentially carry, a, you know, COVID, you're not <laughs> left with a whole lot of stuff for children to get engaged with. So 
I totally understand um, teachers and early years providers' uh, frustration with with having to comply with this. And I think, you know, who knows? Maybe ultimately this will be a no. Maybe somebody will do a before and after <laughs> of a three sixty resource um, to to research, you know, what what's happening and and what that ultimately means to how our children are are able to engage in play and learning. I think that might go beyond the the scope of this session, <laughs> this meeting, but, but I think, yeah, I think exploring space to a certain extent, yes, obviously all the spaces that, that I've just shared are spaces how they were, which might be very different to spaces how they will be um, in the coming academic year, at least for a while. Yeah, yeah, um, of course, but, I, um, but yeah, at least this, you've given us some ideas about how to how to start asking those questions and introducing again just this range of resources that um, many may have stumbled upon or know about and that many of I know like myself included just didn't know about or would not have even thought of um, so I, I think yeah uh, having having some idea about what's out there um, and then getting like using using some guidance to think about well, what kinds of decisions can I make in the new academic year on how, how students can see themselves as, as part of the university, as part of the School of Education, as part of um, a particular cohort, um, as engaged and not just kind of constantly on the receiving end of all this information. Um, I think you've, you've really raised some really interesting ideas and, and possibilities. Um, there's, there's maybe one last kind of area that, we, that I think we could talk about kind of explicitly. I think it's come up in, in the discussion, but it's around feedback um, mm -hmm. and the possibilities for gaining feedback. You know, so you, you spoke at one point, you, you spoke a little bit about you know, peer, students presenting to each other and, um, and, and that kind of thing. But, um, and it made me think of the chat function. <laughs> Again, I have my, my imagination is sometimes limited to Zoom and what Zoom looks like. But there's, I know we've been encouraged to use the chat function, uh, you know, during lectures and during seminars so to help increase engagement and interaction. Um, and I thought, you know, that's a possibility for getting some kind of feedback. Because um, I know you can download the chat after the session as well. Um, but what, do you think that there are any other possibilities or? Yeah, I think there are loads. I mean, I think ultimately any of this is slightly easier if there is a permanent home. Now, if, if, if everything is on Zoom, then it's very fleeting because you've got your individual sessions and then when they're gone, they're gone. So if there is anything like an online learning environment, we've got Blackboard, for example, um, but obviously whether whether you run it, you know, on, on, on Google for, you know, to all intents and purposes, you could set up a Google Drive um, for, for your students. That, but the idea that you have a space where if work is shared or if effort is made, it doesn't disappear at the end of a scheduled session. I think that can be quite important um, because that then allows you to, A, it allows you to prepare in advance which I think is really important so that you don't feel that as soon as the academic year starts, you're in this constant frenzy of, of having to, to sort out the next session. So to have a space that you can start building up over the summer, if at all possible, and decide, OK, I'm going to I'm going to do a film about this. That's where it's going to live. And then the students are going to do that and chart the learning path. They're going to watch the film and they're going to do that activity. Then they're going to share it on that discussion board. You know, that, that, that yeah. sort of outline. Um, but I do think getting feedback right from the start is really important. And I think it's, it's really important to build that kind of culture into the, the programme design. So literally the very first task that my students do is it's, it's a Padlet, which if people haven't come across, is like, it's like a bunch of sticky notes, virtual sticky notes, essentially. Um, and I ask my students, I put a Padlet on and it's embedded into blackboard but you can run it independently it, it just lives there um, on the internet so your students get a link 
and it's like you start a new sticky note essentially and I asked students about their hopes and dreams and fears so hopes mm. dreams and fears linked to the program now again bearing in mind that my students are all over the world um, so some of them have got quite you know so some of them have been teaching for years some of them are absolutely new almost everybody thinks they must be the least pedagogically educated person on the entire program so that again this idea of getting feedback right from the start you know what, what you what are you hoping to get out of this program mm. that allows me to engage actively by responding to those comments um adding to a discussion post and saying okay i can see that there is a fear around lesson planning, which for us is, is the first assignment that they have to do. So I go, okay, well, we've got some self-access resources for you. And, and unit four, you will find that there's some, some great resources there for you to work with. So it allows immediately this, this dialogue. And we have on our program something that I call a reflective nudge. So once a week, I will post something um, and it might be something from current affairs, it might be a, an article, a newspaper article that came out from anywhere around the world, because my students are global, um, or it might be something um, that we've pre-prepared. There are certain times of year where we know students will struggle with how to construct a question, for example. Um, and we post that on a discussion board, and for that week, that's what the students are engaging in. And last year, it got to the point around about November time where there just wasn't a lot of traffic on these discussion boards. So one week's reflective nudge was me going, look, people, you're not engaging with these. What's going on? <laughs> Are they the wrong nudges? What do you want? Um, obviously phrased slightly more polite, but it was a genuine, it was, I, I was flummoxed. You know, I was, I, I've, I've taught this program for five years and every year we've had more and more students and more and more interaction and, and last year was just a bit more quiet than other years so by the time we got around to november i said look what is it you want we can do it just just let us know um, and the students just fessed up and said look you know that they're, they're great but we're just so busy so we're like, okay look you know you don't have to engage every week but try and think okay you know every other week or whatever i'm gonna i'm gonna yeah. look and i'm gonna do something um so I think it's about getting to the point where that dialogue feels natural. And that is something that happens very naturally in a face-to-face, -face, or rather I should say in a campus-based learning environment, because a student might, might stay behind for a bit to chat to you, or they might see you, I don't know, sorting through your papers, or you no, know, it's just a bit more human, shall I say. Um, so again, something that I do with my students, and I thought I thought they must think I'm, I'm just, you know, in, in silly syndrome. I, I do this thing, I do it with all my students. I saw this and thought of you. So I will send out announcements and I say, I came across this webinar, it's got nothing to do with, with, a, with a core program, but I just think you'll find it interesting. It's, it's free, it's then starts when it's happening, or, oh, I just read this article, which I really like. <laughs> <laughs> and I just throw it at them <laughs> and they love it they absolutely love it because it makes everything you know they they, they notice yeah. that you care and mm -hmm. it is genuinely I'm looking at it and, and it is I saw this and thought of you that's exactly what it is I, I read something and I go oh I think that's easy yeah. so anything like that helps to create those kinds of links so that they still feel mm -hmm. that they are part of something you know as we started out with something real not something that yeah. just lives in the computer, but, but a real community. Yeah, and, and I think that's, uh, that's a really important point. You know, it goes back to that idea of recognizing that, that, that our students and the work that we're, we're doing um, works beyond that screen. Um, you know, so I, I think, you know, especially when it comes to a lot of these online learning platforms and um, if we're not used to working with them, it's, it's perhaps easy to see how everything gets uploaded to this thing kind of in the ether mm -hmm. um, and you don't know when and how anyone else is accessing it. Um, so the reality beyond, beyond that ether is, is so abstract. Um, but being very conscious that, well, there's, 
this is just a new medium for for otherwise what would be um, quite a human experience um, and should still be quite a human experience um, will hopefully help us keep on top of engaging through the online medium. Um, so I like that idea of, you know, constantly kind of uh, sending up nudges or sharing information, you know, the, that activity, that constant activity just means that there's, there's a little bit more of a human element and that it's not always a formal communication. Um, you know, I think that barrier is sometimes if, if we send out communications through our online learning space, it goes to students as an email and it's, you know, it comes from the university and you know, it, it looks, it performs a very specific function and it looks a very particular way. Whereas if we start to manipulate some of that communication to yeah. the kinds of communication that we have in classrooms, in between sessions, um, outside of classroom doors, or just as we're packing up, like all those conversations happen in reality. Um, they don't have to stop. Um, and I think that's, that's kind of what, what you're talking about, those, those nudges and thinking about your students are real people on the other side of this and mm. they might be interested or um, they're invested and, um, or that you need to check up on them. Yeah, I think just you saying checking up, I think reminds me, it's, the other thing is, of course they're human and of course they've all got and will have over the coming year, potentially, very different experiences. I mean, I noticed that on my programme, which was very different from, from a UK-based programme because I've got students all over the world. So when COVID hit, it hit different teachers, different students, different schools at different times. So I've got teachers in China who were the first ones in January to go, whoa. And, and then we, we could literally follow the virus moving. Um, with people saying, yep, schools have now shut in Monaco, schools have shut in Italy, you know, and, and and one of the reflective nudges that we did, I, I just stopped everything and I just went, look guys, are, are you all right? You know, <laughs> um, and I think again, we, we need to make space for that because all, all my student teachers essentially uh, were all in classrooms and they were all having to cope with moving everything online. So we just, and, and of course, teaching online was not part of the units that I had carefully prepared for the program. So I just shoved everything out of the window and said, look, you know, let's what, what kind of cool resources have you found? What are you finding helpful? What's useful? And the studio, there was just like this collective gasp of relief from students. Okay, okay we can talk to somebody about this. So again, being conscious of that, and I'm not saying that as tutors, we necessarily are in a position to provide mental health support because obviously there are, there are people trained in that and, and I would never advocate somebody taking over a role at that sort of professional level. Um, but in terms of creating a space where, where students feel able to share, you know, when, when they are concerned or when they are worried or when, when they are unsure about something, I think that is really important. Mm. Okay. Well, I think that's probably a, a useful point to to wrap up. Um, I think, yeah, the 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 ideas that you've uh, that you've helped raise and some of the questions, your responses to them, I'm sure um, a lot of a lot of people who who watch this will will um, gain some insight and at least uh, and get some ideas. Um, but also, I think start hopefully interrogating. Um, what what we sometimes think of as like a, quite a fearful, scary, unknown place, mm. um, and also you know think beyond the limitations of so again what the software sometimes presents or what we think is there. Um, there's a lot of stuff that you're that you're talking about that that seems to draw on you know all the principles of teaching and learning that that so many of us know and do. Um, and, you know, just because it's a, a new space, maybe keep reminding ourselves, don't forget that there's, there's things that we can do that um, don't necessarily have to be completely new, um, but it's about mixing and matching all of these, th all of these ideas as we go along. Um, yeah, so thank you very much.
No, um, thank you. We will have another conversation to the series. 